Yeah, well, I would also like to start uh, my talk by thanking uh, both our organizers for the opportunity to present our work here uh, at this beautiful uh, place. And it's been a very interesting conference, so I learned a lot already. Um, I would also like to thank our organizer and <laughs> my previous speaker um, for giving a very good introduction to our research field. Um, so this means I can actually jump into the physics right away and uh, not uh, spend too much time on um, introduction. So you will have actually, uh, you will get to the coffee um, break uh, faster, maybe. Um, I changed the title. Um, so initially I want to talk about electromagnetic cooperativity, but uh, since uh, it's a generally broad audience here, I decided to also include a bit of our pure quantum um, experiments. Uh, so we are using superconducting qubits um, as well in our lab. So I will have um, actually three topics. Um, to, uh, I'm going to talk about. The work is also collaborative or cooperative, uh, so it has been done at, uh, here locally in Mainz in the chair of Matthias Kloy and also at KIT. Um, now since January I moved or am about to move to Glasgow. I don't have a lab there yet, but um, the data I'm going to uh, present um, is taken in Mainz and in uh, Karlsruhe. Okay, first I will talk about an experiment on analog quantum simulation where we um, uh, simulated um, ultra-strong coupling between a spin and a cavity, or light and matter. Then I will talk about spectroscopic data uh, on a magnetic system without any superconductivity involved. And uh, then last, if there's still time, talk about a recent experiment on synchronizing magnons with photons. So first, um, I would like to talk about the quantum simulation experiment. Um, here's a picture I stole from the Solano webpage. Um, the most uh, general description of interaction between light and matter, or a spin and a cavity, or a qubit and a cavity, or resonator, is the Rabi model, the quantum Rabi model. Uh, that's a Newtonian. there's an harmonic part, there's a qubit part, the spin part, and there's an interaction part. And this interaction um, is given by the strength G, the coupling strength. We seen that Hamiltonian a couple of times. Um, in most cases, G is not a dominating frequency or energy. So it's small compared to the transition frequency of the harmonic part or the qubit part. And um, this is, I think, the experimental situation which has been um, described so far in this conference. However, there's an interest, um, general interest, to um, look at the physics of ultra-strong or deep-strong coupling when this becomes the dominating frequency. There's been recent work um, actually in the field of superconducting qubits. And it's of interest because uh, in nature there are some interactions, uh, for example, for photosynthesis, uh, which are assumed to um, rely on ultra-strong or deep-strong coupling. Um, what does actually ultra-strong or deep-strong coupling mean? This is a busy slide. It's again the Rabi Hamiltonian. And depending on the coupling strengths, um, this uh, can be divided into various regimes of weak coupling, strong coupling, ultra and deep-strong coupling. Strong coupling means there's a coherent exchange between both quantum systems. And ultra-strong ultra -strong regime is entered when the coupling strength is about a tenth of the transition frequencies um, in both systems. And deep-strong coupling means uh, the coupling strength is a dominating energy. Um, these ultra- or deep-strong coupled systems are not exactly solvable, at least not for, a dynamic, for the dynamic case. And, um, but, but for most experiments, um, it is because um, um, the experimental situation would be a strong coupling, and then it can be simplified to the James Cummings Hamiltonian, which is also a typical situation for superconducting quantum circuits, which are typically um, strongly coupled. Now, deep strong coupling is interesting. I have a small animation to explain why graphically. If there's strong coupling, and if one excitation in that coupled system, there's a superposition, and either the qubit is excited or the resonator and uh, there's a coherent swap of um, oscillations going back and forth. If you now increase the coupling strength to ultra-strong coupling, then the situation is way more complicated. You have two, phase, two states with uh, counter-rotating phases in both the qubit and the resonator, and it's a strongly non-classical system. So it becomes highly entangled, and using uh, ultra-strong coupling can be used to actually generate um, a Bell state or a W state. Um, efficiently. Now, the Solano group had a theory proposal um, a few years ago, um, and they showed a way to um, analog implement a quantum simulation of the Rabi model by starting with a Jane's Cummings type system, 
having strong coupling and adding two microwave drives with um, both with a certain frequency and amplitude, eta one, eta two. And there's a bit of mass involved. So essentially one has to go into the reference frame of the first drive, then go into the interaction picture of the qubit, do some basis change. There are some constraints uh, on the frequencies and amplitudes. If you do this mass, it's all in that publication, you end up with an effective new Hamiltonian in the rotating frame, which is of the Rabi uh, type. So the, in, in the first um, energy, the harmonic um, transition frequency is um, set by um, the drive strengths, and um, as well as the qubit frequencies, and both can be tuned um, to the megahertz regime, starting at gigahertz, but effectively slowed down. The coupling is only reduced by a factor of two. So if you choose your amplitude and frequencies um, properly, then you can make the coupling the dominating um, energy part in that system. Here's our experimental implementation of that scheme. We have a superconducting qubit. It's a concentric transmog qubit. We developed a card through, but it doesn't matter so much. This is a qubit system. It's a spin system. Um, there is the bosonic mode or the, the cavity mode, and the qubit is coupled to readout resonator, which is coupled to the transmission line. You see it also here. And um, through the transmission line, we sent in additional drives to implement the analog quantum simulation. Um, if, if you have such a chip, first you want to analyze, you want to characterize it. And um, this, this we did by exciting the qubit, bringing it on resonance with the resonator for a certain time, then um, detuning the qubit, reading out the qubit, and we observe these uh, uh, vacuum, or this, um, um, not, not vacuum, but this, um, um, swap these Rabi, um, this is Rabi signal. Um, and if you detune the qubit, we observe the vacuum Rabi oscillations as expected. And from the frequency here, we can determine the coupling strengths between qubit and cavity mode. That's on the order of five megahertz. Next, we apply one drive, um, additional drive to the system. Um, for the full Rabi model, we would need two drives, but we start with one. Um, we have the qubit in ground state. We detune it, prepare the qubit state, bring it on resonance with the resonator, um, simultaneously apply a drive for time delta t, then turn off the drive, detune the qubit, read it out. And now the um, qubit state becomes really complicated, so it's really instructive to do numerical simulation. Um, we did this using Q-tip, and here you see what we hope to measure, what, what would be expected in the lab frame, so our measurement frame. We would observe, or we would expect to observe these red, um, um, the, the red uh, data, so the, um, these fast oscillations um, with overall an amplitude which is collapsing first, then there's some idling and uh, a revival happening later. And if you take the data, it looks very similar. So we see in the lab frame, we see these fast oscillations, um, an idling period um, where there are still some, there's still some finite amplitude as also expected from theory. And then later on, there's um, a revival happening. And this goes on. Um, of all, there's a decay because uh, we still have uh, T1 and T2 uh, times, uh, limiting the overall um, time scales. So this revival is a hallmark of um, a large or ultra strong coupling. And um, we can quantify the coupling um, for that particular experiment uh, to be on the order of 0.6, which puts us uh, uh, firmly into the ultra strong coupling regime. Um, th this was a simulation with one drive. The full quantum Rabi model requires two drives. Um, we also did that experiment, but um, the data becomes a bit complicated. And, and actually, the, um, the inference of the second drive is not so well, uh, is not so obvious. Um, but if you look at simulations, in black, you have the envelope for just one drive, and in blue, the envelope for two drives. So in the idling period, the amplitude becomes a bit larger. The oscillation frequency changes a bit. So there are some small changes happening. And that's also what we observe in experiment. Um, the amplitude becomes larger, oscillation changes. So we can actually capture the main features. However, <laughs> if you look closely, you see for example, the oscillation frequency is changing a bit. So it's a bit slower here, it's faster here, it gets slower here, and that's not expected from theory. 
we attribute this to uh, a ring up dynamic and also probably um, some crosstalk to additional resonator modes on the chip, which we did not, um, which, we, um, which we also excited or start to excite by sending um, long pulses. Um, so if you, okay, if, if you, no, maybe you notice there's a second resonator here um, being also in, uh, closely in frequency space to the bosonic mode which we used. And so this one is, uh, we start to excite that one as well and it, it um, couples to the qubit as well. So it complicates the system a bit. Um, it's actually, we, we are interested in having a second resonator because we're interested in simulating the spin boson system where we have a bosonic bars uh, formed by lots of resonators. So this was our first step to that spin boson simulation. Okay, now I would like to change gears and uh, actually talk about uh, purely magnetic, purely magnetic uh, experiment. Um, e even done at room temperature, although we also go down to millikelvin temperatures. And our, our interest here is, we, we, it's very similar to what um, our first speaker this morning showed us and we think we share similar interests. So we are interested in single magnon physics. We would like to excite and to detect single magnons to play around with them to create non-classical magnon states. And this we hope to achieve by having our qubit coupled coherently to the magnon. Then, as explained this morning, one can excite the qubit, swap the excitation to the magnon, re-excite the qubit, swap again, and then, for example, build up some uh, quantum mechanical state, like a magnon Fox state in the ferromagnetic system. Um, when we started that project a couple of years ago, um, I think we started 2015, um, so probably a year after these two publications uh, uh, appeared, and I think we heard about both of them uh, in this conference. And since then, lots of other work has been published, so the beast is, beast is becoming very popular. However, um, to our understanding, not a lot of data, um, or maybe no data, has been taken um, uh, covering the temperature regimes from room temperature all the way down to millikelvin. So um, this was our actually start, start project to the field. Um, I, I'm going to go through this a bit faster because Matthias Cloy, who's talking this afternoon, also going to cover um, that uh, research. So, so to do this, we used um, concentric, uh, no, uh, sorry, um, a re-entrant uh, cavity developed by Mark Toba, having a dark and a bright mode. Our X sphere is located in the center uh, of both posts where the magnetic AC field has the largest amplitude. We um, put it in a uh, cryostat and start measuring from room temperature to 4 Kelvin. We also put it in dilution refrigerator so we could measure at millikelvin temperatures. And um, yeah, we observed these about level crossings where we then uh, did uh, fits using input output theory to determine the line width and coupling strengths of the system. Uh, for example, here you see the magnon line width as function of temperature. So in our experiment, we had a line width of about a megahertz, both at room temperature and at millikelvin, um, similar to what um, we found in literature. However, if we do this temperature sweep, then um, at intermediate temperatures, uh, the line width shoots up. And this can be actually well explained by um, coupling um, to um, or scattering processes um, due to uh, coupling uh, to rho Earth's impurities, uh, which is well known. And you can find all the details in Matthias Kloy's talk and also in the publication by Isabel Proventa, which appeared, uh, I think, yesterday online. Um, as I told you before, we are primarily interested in working at millikelvin. Um, and we have to work at millikelvin for single magnon experiments um, to, to make sure there's no thermal excitation in the system. Um, so then the, and, and we also then have to keep the excitation power um, uh, to about one photon in the system. Um, this we did um, in a, so, so we made another cavity, put in a dilution refrigerator in Karlsruhe. It's a cavity looking very similar to the one uh, the Tokyo group developed. So we have a, um, now here it's a rectangular cavity. There's a Yig sphere. Uh, we have a magnetic yoke with permanent um, magnets and also a superconducting coil to tune the magnetic field. Um, again, we apply input-output theory uh, to the scattering data to determine the line width and the coupling strengths of the system. 
this is an image of our dilution refrigerator, and, and the wiring is shown here. This is a standard wiring in our field, so we have a lot of attenuation on the incoming line, then circulators, microwave switches, there's a bandpass filter, a cryogenic amplifier, more amplifiers at room temperature, and uh, vector network analyzers and uh, other microwave electronics. So in the experiments, we see avoid level crossings as we sweep the magnetic field. Um, it's um, we're, we're clearly inside the strong coupling regime. Uh, we can fit the line width and get the, um, uh, the coupling strengths out of it. And or we can fit the scattering data, get the coupling strength and the line width out of that. And now, in the first experiment, we um, did um, um, cavity magnon spectroscopy at different temperatures and different drive strengths. Here you see data, temperature-dependent data for two drive strengths on the cavity, one corresponding, the blue data, to about one photon in the cavity, and the red data point corresponds to about 10 million of photons in the cavity. If you have just one photon, then at really low temperatures, you have a larger line width um, of your magnon. Uh, if you increase temperature, the line width drops uh, till um, it reaches a plateau. And here it's um, fairly stable up to about maybe two Kelvin, three Kelvin before it uh, uh, increases uh, again. And if you then increase the power, you don't observe this um, increasement here at low temperatures. So then the line width is uh, just um, flat for all temperatures. Um, so, so it's clearly um, temperature dependent and power dependent. We've taken similar data, but doing different uh, sweeps. So this was done at uh, 60 millikelvin, the blue data, and the red one at 200 millikelvin. So if you have the um, 60 millikelvin, the fridge at 60 millikelvin, and then start at low power, we have a large line width. We increase the power and, um, at about a certain value, it starts dropping off. The same happens for the higher temperature data, although overall this um, uh, amplitude here is uh, a bit smaller than for the um, uh, colder temperatures. Um, this um, dependency, the power dependency and the temperature dependency, can be explained by a two-level system model. This was also um, showed by our first speaker. Um, it was actually proposed um, in this um, publication uh, back in 2014. The two-level system model is a very well-known system in the field of superconducting resonators nowadays. It's, but it has been actually developed for dielectric materials back in the 70s and 80s. So the um, concept is you have your quantum system, which couples incoherently to a bath of um, defects of two-level systems. And these um, TLS uh, are absorbing energy from your quantum system. And this leads to a line width being power and temperature dependent. Uh, also the uh, frequency um, enters here. Uh, using that theory, we applied it to our data. And so you see the results here. There's, I think there's actually pretty good agreement also with very reasonable um, parameters, uh, fitting parameters for the temperature dependent data. Um, we can do the same for the power dependent data. Again, it fits really nicely, and it um, kind of verifies um, the model proposed by the uh, Nakamura group. Um, so it seems to be, um, the magnons seem to be limited by TLSs. Um, it doesn't tell us where these TLSs are located or what's their origin. I mean, we could speculate, but, um, or, or we can say there is a bath of, there seems to be a bath of uh, two-level systems which incoherently couples to the magnon system. And then um, if you go to high power or high temperatures, it's effectively thermally saturated or energetically saturated and doesn't um, reduce the uh, uh, magnal lifetime anymore. Here's some really fresh data out of our lab. So using um, um, a system um, as depicted here, we have a transmon qubit, a 3D qubit in the cavity. There's a Yig sphere here. We have a coupler uh, to the cavity and uh, several cavity modes in that uh, rectangular um, scheme. We, uh, we started measuring that one and first um, did power spectroscopy on some of the cavity modes. And what we then see is this dependence on power 
uh, this corresponds to a lamp shift. Um, so if you operate the cavity at really high power, then it starts to decouple from the qubit. Um, so at high power, you have the bare resonator or bare cavity frequency. But at low power, it's a coupled system. So then the cube, depending on the qubit frequency, if it's um, below or above the cavity, there's um, a lamp shift um, um, happening, um, pushing the observed cavity mode either up or down. And we observed this for various modes. We also did or started to do two-tone spectroscopy to um, uh, and understand that system uh, better and then eventually um, go um, from spectroscopic measurements to time domain and uh, really play around um, with um, magnon excitations and uh, oscillations uh, between the qubit and magnon. Another direction we um, did in our lab is uh, moving away from YIG sphere to a thin film YIG. Here's an experiment where we had a niobium nitride thin film on this silicon substrate. Uh, we used frequency division multiplex lumped element resonators. You see a, a micrograph here. It's a transmission line um, and several lumped element resonators dangling off. They all have different frequencies. And some of them, and also some part of the transmission line, uh, are covered with a YIG thin film of about, uh, I think, 310 nanometers. Um, we just put it face down on the uh, substrate and then by doing fMR measurements and uh, resonator spectroscopy determined the, the yig loss, resonator loss and the coupling strengths of the system. Um, here's one of our data, uh, data um, um, images are shown. Um, so you see an avoided level crossing, maybe. <laughs> Um, um, but the contrast is not good, um, and uh, it's uh, the in particular the cavity mode is actually really blurred, so it becomes really broad in line with. It's hard to to measure. It, it's visible, but it's uh, not as sharp as we hoping it to see. And also, we can see the ferromagnetic resonance actually being really broad in uh, frequency. Um, but nevertheless, we have the data. We can analyze it. Here you see the. FMR line width of that YIG thin film, uh, which is about 100 megahertz at temperatures of a Kelvin and above. So it's already huge. There's a large uh, line width. The same film had about a megahertz, maybe two megahertz at room temperature. And if you go to lower temperatures, then the line width shoots up even, so up to 120, 130 megahertz. This is FMR data. Um, the resonator, superconducting resonator, um, being not covered with YIG GDD had a line width of about 6 megahertz. If coupled, it um, obtains a line width on the order of 80 megahertz. The coupling strength between both is, I think, on the order of four, maybe 20 megahertz. So um, now we are not in the strong coupling regime any longer. It's weakly coupled, um, essentially because there's so much damping happening um, both in the YIG and the resonator. Nevertheless, it's, uh, I think it's a good test system to um, then sample other materials, um, other ferromagnets, maybe other substrates, and to um, eventually uh, find a good um, high quality thin film resonator um, at uh, working at millikelvin temperatures and providing a uh, strong coupling. Okay, now <laughs> in the third part, I would like to um, talk about recent experiment on synchronizing magnon with photons. That's an experiment done at room temperature, which I find very refreshing to not have to deal with cryogenics and uh, cool down times. And it's very simple, just a room temperature magnet and a VNA next to it. So this experiment is motivated by a theory proposal from the Beijing group, from Xia's group. They published it about a year ago. And it's, it's actually the beast. <laughs> so we have the cavity, we have our ferromagnetic uh, system, um, the, the processing magnetization, and um, we have the two interactions, interaction passes, uh, the Faraday induction, and Pierre's law, coupling both. And in that paper, they propose to apply two drives to the system. So I think typically we have just one drive, so there's a drive to the cavity, and then the cavity, once the cavity is pulsed, it starts to ring up the magnet, but they propose to have a drive talking to the cavity and another drive talking to the 
magnetic, exciting the magnetic the fMR mode directly. Here's a, um, a calculation or simulation what one should expect or should hope to see. Um, if there's just one drive and there's coupling between both, you get the green data. So there's an avoided level crossing, the beast. If you apply a second drive now to the ferromagnet and the second drive has a certain um, amplitude, or amplitude ratio compared to the cavity drive, uh, but the same phase, then the void level crossing increases. Uh, I think it's actually a factor two increasement. Um, and if the second drive has a phase difference of pi, then the gap vanishes. So this, um, I think the brown data, uh, the brown color here um, appears. There's a linear mode uh, having half the slope of the Kittel, um, it's a Kittel uh, mode. And uh, um, essentially in this, re in this situation, um, the synchronization is expected to happen. I can show you more numerical data, <laughs> maybe to explain a bit better what, what's happening. So on the left, you see what's expected for just one drive. This is for two drives having the second drive amplitude at a particular frequency, at a particular amplitude, you see a larger gap opening up. And um, for the same amplitude ratio, but now opposite phases, there's um, no gap and uh, um, a power enhancement um, in the linear regime. So if you pay attention to the scale, it's about a factor 20 larger than for the other two cases uh, to the left and to the middle. So we found this very interesting. We started uh, to think how we can implement it in our lab. And we've chosen a three-dimensional approach using our re-entrant cavity, which I showed you before. Um, there's the Yig sphere. And we modified the cavity and added a second port to the system. It's an inductive loop surrounding the Yig sphere. Um, <laughs> at first, I thought this may not work. It may actually affect the cavity resonance too much. But um, Isabel convinced me that it's actually not the case, and it has more or less the same resonance frequency as before. So one, one can really then um, manipulate directly the ferromagnetic system without changing the cavity mode too much. This is, um, again, the experimental scheme. We have our resonator, our cavity, the YIC. The resonator is driven by the first drive with an amplitude, a phase, and frequency, the same Actually, the same frequency, um, or the same tone, the same frequency is applied to the YIC, but with um, a different phase, different amplitude. This is our experimental implementation. We have a VNA. Um, it's uh, sending out a, a tone uh, to a power divider, and then the, f the top branch goes through a phase delay element, goes to the YIC. The second branch goes uh, through a circulator, uh, talks to the cavity, is uh, reflected off, and then uh, digitized by the VNA. Okay, um, so we did some uh, measurements last week. Um, Christine Dörflinger, who actually did that experiment and submitted her master thesis last week, is not on the image. <laughs> but um, the three other students involved um, are shown. So this is Isabel Buventa, it's Tim Waltz, both of them, no, actually all three, and, um, uh, and Dimo Yao as well, who was visiting us. Um, last week, all three uh, of them are at the conference here. Okay, this is um, the raw data for the 3D cavity, uh, sending two tones, um, but uh, having no phase difference. And <laughs> if you compare both data, this has a, a phase difference of pi, there's not a big difference. Um, only the resonance point is shifting a bit, uh, which we um, attribute to crosstalk. There's still a bit of crosstalk uh, happening. Um, however, um, both drives have the same amplitude. So the one to the cavity and to the yik. If you're now starting changing um, amplitudes, so if you essentially dampen the tone going to the cavity, we see uh, an effect. So if you pay attention, um, here we have a larger gap, uh, having no phase difference. And over here, there's no gap, or a small gap, at least. Uh, if you set the phase difference to pi. So again, going back and forth, something is changing here. Um, we can then analyze that data. Uh, for example, we can take uh, traces along the magnetic field and along the frequency um, axis, and then follow the cavity mode and the Cattell mode. 
uh, and you see both of them are, are synchronizing at certain magnetic fields. Yes, they have the same dispersion relation um, over here for um, a phase difference of pi. And we, we can, from the data, we can also determine the gap. Um, if you first look at the red data and the blue data, that's taken for um, the first data set where we had the same amplitude. Um, the gap changes a bit, but not so much. But now if we start changing the amplitude, uh, we have the green data and the black data. So the gap is either becoming larger or it's uh, uh, almost vanishing, as expected uh, from the theory proposal. Um, this is ongoing work, and uh, we have to take more data, also um, uh, do some uh, numerics to, to check um, um, our system. But I, I found this very interesting, and maybe some of you are also interesting and interested in that, uh, these findings. And we already had some good discussions yesterday in front of the poster. Um, I would like to use um, this talk to also shamelessly advertise our software. So <laughs> we used, uh, um, we spend lots of time on developing our own open source software at KIT, um, mostly actually for qubit measurements, but it can also be used for resonator or spectroscopic measurements. And uh, yeah, you can, that's a link you can find on GitHub. Um, it, uh, it's very flexible, has really nice um, viewing capabilities, in particular live data plotting. And uh, it also includes a circle fit, which we published about three years ago. This is, we didn't invent it, but um, we proposed a scheme how to implement this um, efficiently. And using the circle fit, you can use uh, the real and imaginary part um, to um, fit, uh, to do a simultaneous fit um, in a robust manner, and then determine the um, scattering uh, parameters um, out of that. Okay, I would like to acknowledge the PhD and master students working on this project, um, particularly Isabel Boventa from Mainz. Then um, Marco Furman has been working on the midi Kelvin data. Tim Waltz uh, contributed um, a lot, in particular to the time domain setups. Um, and uh, Christine Dörflinger and Thomas Dorfpisko recently submitted their master projects. I'm moving to Glasgow. There's a position um, or positions available. If you are interested or you know someone who may be interested, then please send me an email or talk to me. I would like to conclude with my summary slide and thank all of you for your attention. Thanks.